A warm welcome to all our participants who joined us this evening for the third session of the day on the 20th day of the Global Festival of Yoga. We are very happy to present before you this festival, which started on 21st June 2020 and continuing up to 20th July 2020, but it also might get extended. We'll let you know about it soon. It's being brought about by Indica Yoga, uh, an inclusive and a platform which offers inclusive and diverse forms of yoga, which focuses on authenticity, immersion and transformation. And we have an excellent lineup of teachers. And this evening we have with us Srimati Nritya Jagannathanji. I request Srimati Nritya Jagannathanji to kindly come on the screen.
नमस्ते नृत्या जी नमस्ते थैंक यू फॉर ज्वाइनिंग दस दिस इवनिंग माय प्लेजर इट्स सच अ डिलाइट टू बी हियर नृत्या जी नीड्स नो इंट्रोडक्शन शी हैज हर स्टूडेंट्स ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड एंड शी इज वन ऑफ द मेन टीचर्स एट कृष्ण माचार्य योगा मंदिरम yet i'll take this uh, take a moment to formally introduce her nritya ji is a senior yoga therapist from the krishnamacharya tradition with nearly two decades of teaching experience she is currently the director of kym institute of yoga studies which is the training and certification wing of krishnamacharya yoga mandiram she has traveled ex- extensively around the world to teach yoga and vedic chanting she is also a certified therapist from the international association of yoga therapists and she is a classical bharatanatyam dancer she is passionate about indian culture philosophy and its spirituality she is the also the editor of darshanam a quarterly journal on yoga and yoga chikitsa of krishna macharya yoga mandiram so with this brief introduction to nritya ji i would like to welcome her and request her to lead a session on a very pertinent topic she will be speaking about the yoga sutras and the title is a beautiful t- title practical wisdom from a timeless text and she has chosen just one word to denote all these things that is atha atha is the very first word of the yoga sutras so she will be taking us through the entire yoga sutra text in a she will give she give, she will be giving us an overview of it and especially also looking into what we call the vyuham in the second chapter which consists of hana heya heya hetu hana and hana paya so with the focus on all these things and giving us an overview of the yoga sutra we will be plunging into yoga sutra yesterday we looked into yoga sutra and its uh, congruence with ramayana and today we are looking into yoga sutra per se we also have one more session dedicated to yoga sutra coming up on sunday morning but completely from a different approach so when we may when we say immersion this is what we mean looking into these uh, seminal texts from different dimensions and just just get soaked into it so this with this background i now request uh, nritya ji to lead us for the next one hour and i also welcome all our participants who have joined us from different parts of the world thank you very much for joining us uh, i i know you would have many questions i request all of you to put your questions on the q and a box that becomes easy for us to present it to our speaker at the end and namaste and over to you nitya ji namaskaram thank you dr banavati and all of you dr uh, mrs anuradha choudhury and everyone at indica yoga for this invitation and very very happy to share this platform once again i start with the prayers that are traditional in the krishna macharya yoga mandira as a salutation to patanjali and also in honor of my teachers shri t krishna macharya who is the you could say the source of all these teachings everything that i share with you comes from him and my teacher shri t k v desikachar the founder of the krishna macharya yoga mandir yogena chittasya padena vacham malam sharirasya cha vaidyakena yo pa karutam pravaram muninam patanjali pranjali ranatosmi abahu purushakaram shankha chakra sidharinam sahasra shirasam shvetam pranamami patanjali shrimate अनंताय नागराजाय नमो नम श्रीकृष्णवागीशयतीश्वराभ्यांप्राप्तचक्राकण भाष्य सारम श्रीनूत्नरंगेन्द्रयत समर्पित स्व 
ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಮಾರ್ಯಂ ಗುರುವರ್ಯಮೀಡೆ ವಿರೋಧೇ ಕಾರ್ತಿಕೇ ಮಾಸೆ ಶತತಾರೃತೋದಯ ಯೋಗಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಮಾರ್ಯ ಗುರುವರ್ಯಮಹಂ ಭಜೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸೂರೀ ದಯಾ ಪಾತ್ರ ಜ್ಞಾನ ವೈರಾಗ್ಯ ಭೂಷಣ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ವೆಂಕಟನಾಥಾರ್ಯ ವಂದೇಹಂ ಯೋಗ ದೇಶಿಕ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮ today i am going to attempt to summarize the teachings of the yoga sutra you could say the yoga sutra is one of the most important texts classical texts on yoga and in fact uh, krishna macharya bases his entire teachings on this text and uh, this would be a quite a mammoth task given the sheer depth and scope of the yoga sutra but i am just going to attempt to give you a birds eye view of certain core ideas and uh, at the heart of this as uh, dr banwati said is the word artha that in that one word quite literally the the content the essence of the entire text is contained and this is what we will now explore <clears throat> one moment there seems to be some problem with the just give me one moment um i want to give you a little bit of a background to why yoga first of all what is the purpose of this text before we go into the yoga and um, the you could say that the purpose of yoga lies in a fundamental understanding of the cycle of karma and every one of us is eternally trapped in the cycle of karma this is one of the fundamentals of indian philosophy see when you take an individual any individual is born to two individuals each of whom have their unique personalities each of them in turn comes from two parents and so on and so our connections to the past are literally endless so many generations now what happens how do we generate this karma i'm giving you a very simple overview of karma because the karma theory is again one of the most complex theories to understand i am attempting to simplify it here <clears throat> see any individual is born with a certain swabhava a swabhava is core personality a portion of that is genetics naturally inherited from the parents from the grandparents this personality is also the result of karma we will see how so take an individual born into this world and goes through anubhava so many experiences i'll give you an example take the birth of a baby from the womb it emerges into the world and its first experience its first anubhava is of not being able to breathe naturally what does it do instantly there is this perception of discomfort this is what we call dukkha what does it do quite naturally without being taught there is corresponding behavioral reaction or a response which we call samskara 
the baby cries. When it cries for the first time, it realizes that in that cry, it's able to open out its lungs and then the process of breathing starts quite naturally. Instantly, this, this infant that's just a few minutes old realizes that that feeling of discomfort can be converted to a feeling of ease, which is sukha. So this is the Anubhava. Now, this becomes planted in this child, in this baby's memory. Remember, the baby is not articulate, cannot use words, does not know language, nothing. But the memory is planted. It realizes that when I am uncomfortable, correspondingly, I have to react. I have to do something. What does this child do? It cries. This is the smriti. It goes into the mind. And what is the outcome? What is the phala? Every time this child experiences discomfort, it could be hungry, it could be just for a change of the diaper, it could be sleepy, it could just be a need to be held, to be warm, or it could be boredom. Little by little, we will see that the samskara and the smriti will constantly reinforce each other and the child learns in a matter of minutes this connection. And I have to do something. I am, experience a dis I am experiencing a discomfort. I need to take an effort to change this into comfort or wellness. This is just one Anubhava. Think of how many millions and millions and millions of Anubhava literally we create as we live, as we grow older. Naturally, what does the mind perceive? It perceives Sukha or it perceives Dukha. But this doesn't stop with just that. There is also the element of the asmita, what we call ego very loosely. My teacher would translate it as identity. So this is my sukha, my dukkha. Ownership of pleasure, ownership of pain. Because it belongs to me, I am experiencing it. So the moment this identity acts as another filter, the whole dynamics of that anubhava change because then it's my experience vis a -vis another's experience. So very clearly we are marking territory and boundaries. Now what happens when you experience pleasure? Naturally there is a raga. There is a desire to recreate. This is true of everyone born human. We all go through the same experiences. A desire to perpetuate pleasure, to recreate experiences of pleasure. At the same time, a dvesha, an avoidance, a feeling of aversion, towards anything that is likely to be painful. Now, naturally, along with this comes fear, abhini vesha. Why this fear? Because deep down, as we grow, we realize that all these little moments of pleasure are temporary. They're there, we enjoy them when they last, and then it changes and something else comes. Immediately, there is a sense of loss, and that brings fear. So fear of loss of sukha, Fear in anticipation of Dukkha. This is a loop that will just go on and on. Smriti and Samskara will keep feeding each other. And naturally, what does the karma theory say? When there is a thought, when that thought translates into words, actions, all of this has a consequence. There is an outcome, phala. The Yoga Sutra, you see the word ashaya. So there is something left behind. Now, what happens in this process of learning, of identifying with Sukha and Dukkha also, is that a cycle is established because of the Smriti, because of what I remember of the Anubhava, because of what I remember of the feeling associated with that Anubhava, there is also correspondingly a certain input that goes into the Swabhava and it alters the Swabhava of the individual. We go through so many such transformation, some pleasurable, some painful. Most commonly, we remember the pleasurable ones. We remember the painful ones because the pleasurable ones we take for granted. We take sukha for granted. But these are adding layer after layer after layer to our swabhava and therefore altering the anubhava. And we see this in our lives because we don't react to the same object or person or place or event in the same way. It's the same person going through the experience, but at different times our reactions are different. Why? 
because what we are fed by our smriti is different see for instance if you take a coconut tree <clears throat> See, uh, the coconut tree, you could say, is one of the icons of India, of, of a tropical country. You go to Kerala, you see these lovely coconut trees swaying in the wind. So it could be an object of beauty for someone who has never visited a tropical land. For such a person, the Anubhava, when you see a coconut tree, is pleasurable. And uh, naturally, the coconut is tasty. All of these are associated pleasurable experiences. Now take the case of someone who happens to sit under a coconut tree and by chance a stray falling coconut falls on him or her. The Anubhava, the experience is the same. Naturally the Anubhava is different. And for such a person, the same coconut tree is no longer an object of pleasure or an object of sukha. The moment you see coconut, you only think of the incident of how you got hurt and therefore fear. This cycle will just go on and on and through our lifetimes, we are creating new karma. Every thought creates a karma seed. This is called Sanchiya Mana. Now, there are some consequences that we live out in the course of our lives. Naturally, our lifetimes are not enough because we generate so much karma and these seeds that are planted don't have the time to germinate. What happens to them? They are stored in a subtle form as the vasanas, subtly which continue to remain even after the physical form is lost, these vasanas feed into what is called sanchita. In very, very uh, modern day terms, you could think of sanchita as a cloud. Literally, it's a virtual cloud storage of karma. Some total of all these karmic impressions we've accumulated over years, over millions and over so many lifetimes. Out of this sanchita karma, there will be some karma seeds that are very, very powerful, just pushing. And those become the prarabdha karma, which determines the cycle of an individual's life. And so it's the prarabdha karma that decides why I am born in a particular place, in a particular time, to a particular set of individuals. The context of my birth, all of this is because of the prarabdha karma. Now, this is a loop that we just go through again and again and again. But at some point, we should ask ourselves, how long? How long do we do this? Is there ever an end to this cycle? And when you think about it, what can you do about the past? We can't go back and change our parents. We can't change the prarabdha. Once you're born, the prarabdha is a part of your life. Neither could we do anything about the sanchita karma. Because the sanchita is again in the past and we have no ability to see what lies behind us. In fact, uh, there's this very beautiful conversation in the Yoga Vashishtam where Rama asks his guru and he says, I'm just overwhelmed at this concept of karma, of what a burden that I carry. And I just don't know how to cope. And uh, uh, Vashishta tells him there that don't look behind, look ahead. Do what you can to make the next step count. Your present and the next step, because your present moment determines the next step. Can we do something to ensure that we don't create such a burden of karma in the here and the now? Little by little, as the weight of this, uh, of this clarity increases, this will naturally efface what is in the past. And this is where yoga becomes a very, very potential tool. See, what happens is, See, here again, naturally, when we speak of samskaras, samskaras can be good, samskaras can be bad. When I say good or bad, I mean positive or negative in terms of their influence. So when the vyuttana samskaras, that is the negative samskaras, dominate, then one gets immediately caught in a loop of dukkha because it will keep triggering the kleshas. The kleshas will trigger the vrittis. From the vritti, the karma takes place, the karma creates samskaras, samskara creates smriti. This again further feed, feeds into the vyuttana samskara. And this is a brilliant uh, model that comes through in the uh, Bhagavad Gita in chapter 2, where Krishna tells Arjuna, what is the starting point? Sangha, attachment, the attachment that we have to certain ideas, to ideologies, to viewpoints, to objects, to places, to experiences. And out of the sangha, there is karma. There is an excessive desire. I want more. I want more. 
and there is no satiation of karma because desire is like a fire it can consume the very wood that it uses as its alamana as its support and what happens when you don't get what you want or if someone else gets it or you get it and you lose it the next step is krodha anger and this anger is blinding there's no sanity there is no clarity in that state it leads to sammoha complete delusion clouding of what is right what is not there's no clarity what is to be done what is not to be done no clarity in turn smriti vibrama naturally we start distorting our memories and we all do this because there are often memories that we don't really want to remember they are very unpleasant and so we distort over a period of time we will convince ourselves that things happened in a way other than what they actually did and our memory will serve this at this point what happens krishna says buddhi nasha there's a complete loss of whatever um, uh, you know clarity or intellect or intelligence we possess everything is gone the final stage is pranasha complete annihilation we see this happening in in the in the mahabharata the kurukshetra this is what happens we are seeing this complete uh, descent the the spiral that takes to pulls you down where is it starting from it's starting from the human mind if we see it today in our present day lives the the result of sangha increasingly now in the last few months what are we attaching to we have seen incidents across the world brutal abuse of power coming from where from sangha from karma lust for power lust for lust for control all of this and we are heading towards pranasha this is our current scenario and this loop will just perpetuate perpetuate again and again and so what do we do so in this context we should think about why yoga because all these uh, darshana systems they emerge to answer these fundamental questions about our life why are we here why do we think the way we do why do we do the things we do what are the consequences because we can't act without ownership of consequence that is not acceptable and therefore what is the path that lies ahead the purpose of the darshanas is to hold up a mirror the word darshana is to see but it holds up a mirror to what you really are and hopefully we use that mirror as a way of changing <clears throat> see from a very philosophical perspective you can say yoga is a moksha sadhana like all the darshanas it shows us the way to sukha prapti dukha nivritti but primarily what is its goal eventually to lead the soul towards kaivalya how by transcending this world of matter little by little we move to a state of eternal freedom but when we look at the same text philosophical text no doubt but if we change the lens if we make it a more modern contemporary lens we realize that the yoga sutra has an abundance of information insights on how do i live my life here and now in this present moment with clarity faith responsibility courage and this is something my teacher would always say he would say yoga is not an escapism it's not about you know leaving behind your uh, dharma and running away to the forest in fact the words he would be use were you have so many files that you've opened you have to close the file you can't run away and so yoga gives us a way to be anchored in this present moment so that i and every one of us can be the very best that we can be we can be at our peak potential you engage and contribute to the world you give and receive with compassion integrity and clarity this is where the teachings of yoga truly are significant <coughs> and we see that each philosophy each darshana has a different world view yoga specifically throws its attention on the scope of the human mind that is its frame of reference and what does it show us not only the great heights that one can ascend to it can also show you the really frightening depths of depravity and complete confusion that the same mind can cause us to descend to <coughs> this is very a common saying mana eva karanam manushyanam bandha mokshayo 
Whether I'm bound or I'm free is a choice. Where is this choice? It's in my mind. When does this choice happen? Now, it happens in this moment, in every moment. We don't have to worry about the past. Whatever we've done in the past, this moment, what is it that I choose to do? Is the question that we all need to ask ourselves. This brings me to the view. This is one of the most uh, brilliant structure. You could say that this is a remarkable problem solving approach. It applies in the Yoga Sutra context, Patanjali speaking about a movement towards Kaivalya. But the same model can be taken out of that philosophical context, applied to any problem situation. This is the base that we at the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram as well follow for yoga therapy, for applications of yoga therapy. Central to this model, heyam dukkham anagatam. Very beautiful idea. See, Patanjali, in speaking about dukkha, he says, dukkha meva sarvam vivekina. He says, this, this whole world is full of dukkham. Krishna says, dukkha layam idam jagat in the, in the Bhagavad Gita. This is the abode of misery. So for the Vivekinaha, for the one who knows everything is Dukkam, which brings us to the question, what do we do? How do we deal with this Dukkam? And what Patanjali tells us is that, see, it might seem very negative when he says Dukkam eva sarvam, but what is he trying to tell us in the next Sutra, Sutra 16 of chapter 2? Heyam Dukkam Anagatam. You can't do anything about the Dukkha that has already come, that has been a part of your past. But anagatam dukkam heyam, what is yet to come, can be anticipated and steps can be taken to prevent, completely avoid this dukkam. So heyam, what is to be, what are the symptoms that are to be avoided is the center of this model. Hetu, what is the cause? See, at a surface level, there can be immediate causes. Parinama, tapa, samskara, dukkaihi, guna, vritti, virodhacha. Dukkha meva sarvam vivekinaha sutra 15. So there are immediate causes. Something changes or there is a desire that's not fulfilled or we become attached to the samskaras. But regardless of the superficial cause, there is a deeper cause, which is samyoga. This is what Patanjali presents and he says, the drashta and the drishyam are two separate entities, but they seem to be together. There is a conjunction where the mind does not realize that it is the purusha that is the master and it is merely a servant. It is clouded because of the kleshas and it thinks of itself as the drashta, as the doer. This is the samyoga. In Sutra 24, Patanjali takes us further and he says, where is the samyoga coming from? He attributes it to the five kleshas, avidya, the wrong knowledge, the inability to identify what is nitya, anitya, what is permanent, impermanent, shuchi, ashuchi, what is pure, what is impure, dukkha and sukha. We don't know the difference. Atma and anatma, we don't know the difference. This is avidya. Avidya in turn gives rise to asmita, false identity, raga, constant desire for pleasure, dvesha, aversion to pain, avoidance of anything that's uncomfortable, abhinivesha, fear. And this we've seen now the cycle, experience after experience, the kleshas will feed our memory, memory feeds the samskaras, samskaras contribute to the vrittis, this cycle goes on endlessly. And he says, what is your goal? See, eventually the goal as far as yoga is concerned is drishehe kaivalya. What is he saying? Uh, in Sutra 25, he says, tat abhavat samyoga abhavaha when this avidya comes down, naturally the samyoga comes down. Tat drishehe kaivalyam. Samyoga abhavat tat drishehe kaivalyam. Eventually the goal is, the hanam is kaivalyam, freedom, liberation for the trashta. This is the long term spiritual goal, the purpose of yoga philosophy. We we'll leave it aside. This is the goal. But what does this mean? What does this freedom mean for us here and now? It means that we cannot become prisoners of our thoughts. There has to be a way of functioning with clarity all the time, every moment. And there has to be a way to achieve it. Ha no paya ha. 
ವಿವೇಕ ಖ್ಯಾತಿ ಅವಿಪ್ಲವ ಹಾನೋಪಾಯ ಲಿಮಿಟ್ಲೆಸ್ ವಿವೇಕ ಲಿಮಿಟ್ಲೆಸ್ ಡಿಸೈನ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ಓನ್ಲಿ ವೇ ಟು ಓವರ್ಕಮ್ ದ ಬರ್ಡನ್ ದ ಕ್ಲೌಡಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ಅವಿದ್ಯ ಸಿಸ್ ಪತಂಜಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವಿ ಸಿ ದಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಮಾಡಲ್ can be applied in so many situations identify the problem identify the symptom this is what we do in therapy what are the causes given a certain cause what is the goal what is the immediate anam what is the short term goal what is a process goal what is the long term goal then you identify the tools and you constantly apply the tool review the feedback again evaluate if new symptoms are coming now this has to be seen in conjunction with the model of the panchamaya that appears in the taitriya upanishad in brahmananda valli where the five dimensions body annamaya pranamaya the vital level manomaya cognition vijnanamaya the deeper personality behind the cognitive ability anandamaya you could say is the core and the emotional uh, layer the ability to experience great joy and also great silence so we have to look at both these models simultaneously and we see that the symptom can manifest at any dimension of the panchamaya sorry the cause can be at any dimension of the panchamaya it doesn't necessarily just because you have see for instance someone can have a back pain from a therapy perspective the back pain can be because of bad posture or the back pain can be because of stress so the the cause can lie at a completely different dimension now depending on your assessment of the cause accordingly you can set goals depending on the capacity of the individual and based on this based on this assessment apply the tools this applies even to a business problem solving model it applies to a problem solving model within relationships and so this is a brilliant idea to constantly keep us focused on the present what can i do and that's the beauty of the yoga sutra that it keeps us looking ahead there's no time to look behind because you can't change it but look ahead what can i do the next moment next step the next atha what is it that i can do prabalena durbalasya badha this is not going to change our negative samskaras are not going to just change like that what can you do you don't feed them in fact this is something my teacher would always say he would say there will be there will always be vitthana samskaras because that is the nature of the mind we are all ordinary people what can you do don't feed that instead for some time try to change the samskara focus on something that is enjoyable something that is uh, calming something that is relaxing something affirmative try to build up these samskaras little by little as these gain strength the vitthana samskaras naturally will find their way out of the system and this is why yoga is so powerful because it is about bringing about a change from the vyuthana samskaras into the nirodha samskaras what are we changing when you speak of the chitta and the vyuthana nirodha samskaras the vyuthana comes from the flux of the gunas nirodha samskara patterns of clarity attention focus come when sattva dominate and rajas and tamas are relatively less so vyuthana samskaras are clearly indicated in chapter 1 sutra 31 where patanjali presents the accompanying symptoms he says dukha daurmanasya angame jayatva shwasa prashwasa vikshepa sahabhava when there is vikshepa when there is clouding of the mind along with this clouding what happens there is dukha a feeling of sorrow disease unease daurmanasya negativity low mood depression angame jayatva weakness debility of the body and a sort of a, a if an inability to cope with any situation angame jayatva can manifest at all levels of the system shwasa prashwasa most important because there is a uh, the the breath will tell you when there is something wrong and something that's going wrong at the mind level what do you do all of us have these at different points in our lives to varying degrees depending on the context but this can be changed and this is the beauty of the yoga sutra when he says eyam dukham anagatam the anagatam what is yet to come you address by trying to change these samskaras so what do you change the dukkha has to be replaced with a sense of sukha well being ease comfort dhaurmanasya negativity to be replaced with an attitude of positivity 
it's difficult, it's not easy to try making little changes here and there. See, for instance, so you might say, I hope it doesn't rain today. I hope it does not rain today. Is quite the same thing that you say, I hope it is a sunny day. We are, the intention is the same, but there's a slight shift from being a negative to being a positive. So small changes, if we can start bringing about in our thoughts, how do we do it? Through the practice of yoga, through diet, through lifestyle, etc. Angami Jaitwa, the debility of the body has to be replaced with Angasthairyam, resilience, the ability to endure in any situation. In the Bhagavad Gita, when Arjuna says, what do I do when I'm tormented by the, by the agitations of my mind, by the changes, this constant shift? And Krishna says, Titikshaswa, you have to endure, for which we need strength. Shwasa Prashwasa, the disturbed breathing, has to be replaced with Dirgha Sukshma Prana, a gentle, subtle, long breath. And so we see that Patanjali gives us this beautiful model um, from, the, from here, the Ashtanga begins from Sutra 28. Because he's saying, Aviplava Viveka Khyata, you need a limitless discernment if we have to move towards Kaivalyam. But Kaivalyam is not a switch that you turn on and off. Something has to be done. What is it that has to be done? You have to learn to quieten the mind. The mind has to be brought to a state of attention. This is Chitta Vritti Nirodha. And the word yoga is considered to be synonymous with Samadhi, a state of meditative absorption. Now the Yoga Sutra, Yoga Sutra and all these yoga texts hold that the only way that you can break free from this burden of the past karma is to bring your mind to a state of meditation to create utter focus and attention so that new karma seeds are not being planted. Now, if that state of samadhi has to be achieved, one needs to learn to meditate. You have to first connect to your object. Dhyana, dhyayi, chintayam. The mind has to connect. It has to think about an object. So there is a preceding step. For dhyana, what has to happen? Dharana, concentration is needed because the mind is so conditioned to moving in n number of directions. If I gave you a minute and said, just watch your thoughts. You can start in Tokyo and end in Argentina. And you can look at uh, Vada Pav on the way, tea, monsoon, COVID, all these thoughts will come in a matter of 60 seconds. So out of this, this you know, there's so many thoughts taking you in all directions, the ability to bring your mind to attention is called dharana. Desha bandha chittasya dharana. Chapter 3, Sutra 1. The ability to direct your mind towards a particular object, dharana. When that attention is sustained, tatra pratyaya ikatanata dhyanam. Ikatanata, the mind flows like honey towards the object. Tadeva artha matra nirbhasam swarupa shunyam iva samadhi. In that state, has the, it, it appears as if the object completely overpowers the mind. Briefly, the mind's identity is lost. This is the path that leads you to Kaivalya. But how does one do this if the senses are always looking outside? Therefore, Pratyahara becomes a preceding step where there is a natural withdrawal. Remember that in the yogic tradition, there is no room for suppression. Because suppression will only trigger an aggravation later. Sublimation is the path. So there has to be a natural withdrawal of the senses. As the Bhagavad Gita says, like a kurma, like a tortoise. As it senses a threat, it will slowly pull its limbs in. That is pratyahara. A pratyahara cannot be forced. It has to happen. What will make pratyahara happen is the practice of pranayama. Because when you start focusing on the breath, naturally, the, the various... Um, the restlessness of the mind comes and the mind comes into attention. But to do pranayama, you have to sit in a stable seated posture for a certain period, which is why asana becomes a prerequisite. It is preparatory to doing pranayama, which in turn will enable pratyahara. Now, this could be complete. You could say these six limbs are enough. It could be a shadanga yoga. Why is he speaking of yama and niyama? Because unless there is personal transformation, it is not called yoga. Yoga sadhana, you cannot overcome karma unless there is a change in, the, in your mind. 
and therefore niyamas as personal disciplines shaucha santosha tapas swadhyaya ishwara pranidana as personal disciplines ahimsa satya asteya brahmacharya aparigraha how we relate to the environment all of this comes together and this forms the basis for your path towards clarity and as patanjali says the benefit of this yoga anga anushthanat ashuddhikshaya the impurities the kleshas come down naturally when the kleshas come down jnana deepti he the jnana is already there but it is hidden by this cloud so there is a deepti there is a kindling of this knowledge and aviveka kyate this discernment that will take us towards kaivalya results desikacha draws this beautiful parallel when he says chitta vritti niroda and vritti sarupya mitaratra he compares it to dharma and adharma and he says the dharma of the soul is to shine it will illuminate everything and so the sattva dominant state is the highest and it is our dharma to possess these um, this clarity but the clouding is happening on account of i just said tamas and therefore we make wrong choices that are hurtful impetuous arrogant causing harm and this is what binds us because the prison is of our own making and so adharma is the outcome and there is adharma there is more sanchita karma and the cycle just goes on and krishna macharya says therefore that dhyana and samadhi are but cause and effect and it's only you have to put in some effort when now when you put in the effort with the grace of ishwara naturally chitta vritti nirodha happens when devoid of that grace there is confusion chitta vikshayata i'll quickly take you through what the state of yoga is see this is your normal mind the mind is full of impressions full of layers where is the question of the purusha seeing itself in such a mind we understand that the nature of the mind is to show the external world to the purusha and to also show the purusha itself but in a mind that is so loud so full of chatter what is the question of the purusha seeing itself naturally there is clouding but when we start to meditate little by little we see that gradually yoga chitta vritti nirodha the mind which is going in different directions slowly restrained focuses on one object sustains this without distraction for a period what happens there are periods of tranquility of silence and in those silence moments the chitta shines through this process of meditation and if you go further at the highest level tada drashtuku swarupe avasthanam eventually when the mind relinquishes all its connections outside and it turns completely inwards this is the highest state of yoga tada drashtuhu the purusha sees itself mirrored in the mirror of the mind this is the pinnacle of clarity leave alone kaivalya see that is a different state what does this imply it implies great clarity viveka at every moment there is clarity about what to say what to think what to do this is the outcome of yoga but this journey to what comes after is not easy it's a transformation and it starts now in this moment and it doesn't doesn't just happen like that and here we must remember that while there is a lot of uh, definitely benefits comforts even to learning online learning virtually nothing can replace the teacher it is through the guru it's only from the guru mukha that one has to learn and krishna macharya was very emphatic about this and this is also what patanjali indicates when he says atha yoga anushasanam the very first sutra atha now here yoga the subject anushasanam an authoritative instruction <coughs> the word atha literally means now yoga comes from the root yuch which means to yoke to unite it also indicates samadhi anushasanam you could say is teaching a sound body of knowledge that has stood the test of time atha indicates also adhikara and mangalartha as per the commentaries anushasanam indicates that it is a discipline pre existent that has to be followed very interesting because patanjali does not attribute himself as the author of the yoga sutra 
merely using the word atha and anushasanam he indicates that he is continuing a subject the source of which we attribute to hiranyagarbha so many other the commentaries take us to other sources but patanjali's role as a compiler and a transmitter what humility and there in that sutra is something that um, our teacher shri deskachar would always say and this is a very unique um, explanation interpretation that comes from the kevan tradition he says the atha the word atha represents the adhikara the eligibility of the teacher because this is not just an ordinary teacher the teacher has to have gone through a process of learning with a guru done the sadhana integrated that sadhana and then become ready to teach anushasanam represents the readiness of the student to learn the humility to receive from the teacher and our teacher would say in that shared space between the teacher and the taught something happens something magical happens that transformation is yoga but how can this transformation happen it can happen only when the mind is anchored in the here and the now because if you're worried about the past then the this whole the cycle of fear starts if you're worried about the future again it is based in fear her only solution is to look at this moment and every subsequent moment and this is why krishnamacharya emphasizes that yoga is a satsamskara essential samskara essential preparation what does it do moment to moment to moment it prepares your body prepares your breath prepares your senses leading you towards something higher eventually in some lifetime in some janma with the grace of ishwara kaivalyam perhaps but in the here and now you become functionally better this is what my teacher would say what happens when you pay attention you become a master of what you're focusing on and when he, casually he would say the one who practices yoga if you're a teacher you become a better teacher if you're a doctor you do your work better you become much more skillful in your surgery and if you are a thief you become even more adept a thief because yoga is about bringing that state of attention what are the anchors on the path and this is the the rest of chapter 1 you have abhyasa fundamental you need to do something some effort has to be made i can't just sit and say i want to change my mind i need to take a step if i move from point a to point b i have to take that step and taking that step is not enough i have to let go of my foot so that i can move this is vairagya so abhyasa is the anchor the beginning the practice vairagya is the ability to let go shraddha Uncon unconditional faith the ability to hold as truth the teachings of the masters the teachings of the guru parampara why should i hold it because it's not yet mine it's not my experience but somewhere i have to believe that this is the experience of the guru parampara and until that experience is mine i have to wait i have to be patient and i have to hold that with reverence this is shraddha and most importantly ishwara pranidhana krishna macharya would say this process itself it starts in this moment often you know we ask this question to our students where do you begin in yoga and my teacher desikachar would say you start where your student is at this moment every time when we go for a consultation or when we see our students because we have a usually we have a one is to one model and so when we do a consultation the student would have told us certain things certain um issues that they are facing then you ca they come back for class 2 sometimes they are not at that level their level has changed a they have practiced something has changed or some other circumstances happened and their level is now lower more pain more discomfort something else and therefore again orient yourself to that atha arambhanam samshilanam <clears throat> punaha punaha start and then refine start move pay attention again refine and so always come back to a new atha observe take feedback and then progressively move to the next step so this is a very sound way of moving in fact as you see in um, i think desika's commentary um apraptasya praptihi yoga to move to a place that has not been achieved before is yoga 
that's not enough praptasya rakshanam kshemam you have to hold on you have to preserve what has been achieved how do you do this by being in the atha be in the present moment and observe so this we need the abhyasa will prevent us from being stagnating Detach detachment vairagya is needed because you can become egoistic and spiritual arrogance is very very easy to to get to that point you know i am a yogi i am a yoga practitioner i can stand on my head for half an hour so quickly we get into these traps again the cycle of karma starts so to let go of the attachment to the practice to the outcomes shraddha gives us direction because the entire chapter 3 is about the vibhutis what kind of powers unfold for one who is capable of bringing the mind to a state of attention even more vairagya is needed because that is not our goal uh, patanjali says uh, sutra 37 of chapter 3 ते समाधा उपसर्गा व्युत्थाने सिद्धय इट्स ओनली द व्युत्थान चित्ता दट कन्सिडर्स द सिद्धीस समथिंग वर्थ पेइंग अटेंशन टू ते समाधा उपसर्गा फॉर द वन हु सिक्स द हाईएस्ट समाधि दे आर बट ऑब्स्टेकल्स सो वैराग्य इज नीडेड श्रद्धा इज नीडेड टू स्टे कमिटेड टू द गोल एंड अबव ऑल एल्स इज ईश्वर प्रणिधान व्हाट इज ईश्वर प्रणिधान यस अ डीप कनेक्शन अ सरेंडर to the supreme but at a very very practical level because yoga has to be universal yoga is universal you could choose to believe in an ishwara or not at the highest level what is ishwara pranidhana it is reverence it's a sense of wonder for everything a realization that there's no difference between what is within and what is without and therefore everything is treated with great love with reverence with respect with value this is ishwara pranidhana and at a practical level my teacher would say ishwara pranidhana is acceptance accept what is don't question accept it and let it go you can change it that's okay but accept every moment as it unfolds everything brings a gift can you accept it the more you fight the more we struggle if we can learn to accept heyam dukham anagatam accept the dukha what is to come is what we can change and so this is the you could say the the substance of this path of yoga abhyasa vairagya shraddha ishwara pranidhana give us the support the key to all this how do we do it we have a teacher one of the simplest tools is the breath among all these tools we spoke about dukha daurmanasya angame jayatva shwasa prashwasa so vyuttana samskaras very difficult to change a state of dukha and you can't just tell someone don't be depressed don't be sad because their reality is the pain one has to acknowledge one has to be sensitive what can you do there is something we connect because the breath becomes an anchor because it is something that leads you from one moment to the next continuously this is why it is called ananta that which is endless flows from one moment to the other and so as we link to the breath every time whatever it is when we are overwhelmed by the vyuttana the breath becomes a very very powerful tool which is what the hatha yoga pratipika says chale vate chalam chittam nischale nischalam bhavet when you control the breath naturally the mind gets control we start at a very basic level say when you are angry be upset don't know how to react ordinary average human level what can we do stay away take few breaths and something will change to the way we react to the same situation later we can worry about um uh, kumbhaka and uh, the highest levels of pranayama kevala kumbhaka turiya state all this is later here and now we have to sort out and so the breath becomes a very important uh, vehicle for this as patanjali says ananta samapatti because we need stiram and sukham see stiram and sukham is not just at asana it's important asana needs to have the quality of stiram and sukham but what is the stiram and sukham the ability to be stable and at ease no matter what life throws at us this is what we need to learn from the asana it's not merely standing on the head and along with this prayatna shaithilya little by little little by little through a well directed effort reduce the resistances because naturally the vyuttana samskaras are constantly going to hinder and asana can play a tremendous role in changing the samskaras of the body pranayama brings about a change in the samskaras of the mind chanting the tool of japa chanting mantra 
can do a great transformation at a vijnanamaya level and all these practices especially dhyanam can bring about changes at an anandamaya level and so you see a complete shift uh, little by little through the well directed use of the breath and its associated components we see transformation can be remarkable and so the breath becomes our lifeline because it links us to the outside and what what when you work on the breath it can have very far reaching changes on the mind and so where do you begin here and now you start with one breath at a time because of all these resources that we have the breath is the key it's very simple that if you had to raise your arms and lower your arms this is you could say just okay arms up arms down but what a difference it makes when you breathe in raise your arms up and breathe out and you lower your arms it changes the entire dynamics of just that posture and this is why of all these tools what is it that will root us in the center if you asked me what would be a tool that is useful for us because we are not yogis we are still at a vyuttana chitta level what is it that we can work with we work with the breath because that is our atha and so in conclusion is this question where is your mind because this is what yoga is all about because i am physically present where is my mind as long as i am rooted in the present and then in every subsequent atha then so much is possible we can change the weight of our prarabdha karma but the choice is us and this is why when i began i said that if you look at the entire sutras i'm just summarizing here the first four sutras give you a summary of the text so patanjali is very clear he says if your mind is in a state of attention what happens kaivalyam happens tada drashtuhu swarupe avasthan if not what happens the vyuthana samskara stay go vyasan is commentary to sutra 12 of chapter 1 says that the mind is like a chitta nadi it's like the river it can flow either to the direction of what he says kalyanavaha kaivalya pragbharam chittam the, the chittam automatically turns towards kaivalyam because the mind is so filled with positive affirmative uh, thoughts or it can move in the direction of what he calls papavaha in the flow of uh, um, you know inappropriate actions adharmic actions and so on where does it lead you samsara pragbharam it brings you back into the samsara endlessly and so this patanjali tells us what yoga does what it doesn't do and he says that what can you do yoga ha chitta vritti nirodha bring your mind to a state of attention because being bound or being free is your mind your experience of the world is coming from your mind and therefore control your mind regulate the mind when do you do it atha atha yoga anushasana in this moment i did it before now i i was distracted i let go of my practice what should i do it doesn't matter start again because this is a fresh atha and so every moment if we can reiterate this and anchor ourselves here then the path becomes much easier and the tools of yoga can serve to support us much better so i conclude with this and i'm ready to take any questions if you have them thank you nitya ji for this wonderful stunning presentation i should say thank you very much uh, you just mentioned in the course of your presentation in the shared space between the teacher and the student something magical happens and today we were witness to that miracle to that magic that unfolded in front of us thank you that's all credit to my teacher that if it wasn't for sir we i wouldn't be here yeah i mean uh, we had one of our speakers who was saying that our only qualification is our teacher yes so it was such a wonderful statement and throughout the presentation the way you were referring to him i mean it was just an an a, a witness to something profound that you would have experienced when his uh, guidance and his mentorship and that was coming out to at every stage and at every point thank you in the presentation and uh, we could also feel his presence uh, with what you shared thank you very much thank you so maybe uh, i would uh, start with that question itself 
because you were referring to him so much. Would you like to share uh, a couple of experiences, uh, especially in the learning space uh, that you had with him and uh, yeah, anything that comes to your mind at first, the moment you think about him? Um, one thing immediately, if I would say, was relationship that for him, yoga was a relationship. And he managed to create that relationship with every one of his students, not in the same way. Uh, we have Nirmana Chittani, Asmita Matra, the chapter four, you have the sutra. Mm. That transformation happens only because of the Asmita, because of your connection. Each of us saw a different uh, Desikachara, I must say. And he was able to adapt himself to the level of the learner. And he could offer whatever he had to offer to you as you needed it. If you were a child, I've seen him do his consultations. He'd come down to the level of a child. If it was an older person, very worried about their health, automatically he'd shift focus. And so for him, relationship was key. Over and above everything, what he has taught us, and I think what we uphold at the KYM, is to create that kind of a relationship with our students. And he says, when that rapport, when that kind of a shraddha is there in the relationship, then everything else will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. Then even if you teach a wrong course, there will be something good to come. You can't teach a wrong course, but suppose by mistake you teach something inappropriate, the power of that relationship would change it. And I've seen many students just drop in merely to see him and not, not even to learn from him. They just come, say, oh, I've seen you, I'm feeling so much better now. That for me, I would say is one thing out of so mm -hmm. many experiences that we have. Thank you so much for sharing that. So I'll just uh, take a few questions sure. and we have very learned audience, I must say, because the type of questions they ask, uh, it only comes from uh, deep engagement with the subject. So we have, I club two questions because I find a lot of similarities or some connection in them. One is from Sunil Kumarji and another is, one is from Ramnathanji. Mm -hmm. uh, Sunilji asks, uh, we have the reference to the Kaivalya in Yoga Sutra or in the Yoga tradition. In the Vedanta tradition, we have reference to Moksha. Mm. What is the relationship? Or in the Yoga, is there a state beyond Kaivalya also? Is a question from Sunilji. I'll come mm -hmm. it with the other one. So maybe you want to take them together or you take a call on that. Uh, Ramnathanji is asking, Shiva Samhita, can you comment on Shiva Samhita? Because Shiva Samhita seems like a a kind of an attempt to bring together Vedanta and yoga. So uh, if you want to share comments on these two questions together, yes, please. See, I would say that a lot of these Hatha Yoga texts come somewhere in the intermediate period between the Darshanas and contemporary yoga. So naturally, they are trying to bridge a lot of things through their practices. Um, beyond this side, there's nothing specific. We'd have to say that we've I've looked at this text the Shiva Samhita, but not at the depth that I have looked at the Yoga Sutra, because in our tradition, the Yoga Sutra is considered among the most important. Now, as far as the goal of yoga, as far as Kaivalyam is concerned, see, yoga concerns itself only to till what happens as far as the mind is concerned. So at the very end in Sutra 34 of chapter 4, Patanjali says, Purushartha Shunyana. The Shunya, the Purushartha, the purpose is finished. Gunanam Pratiprasavaha. The gunas have also become Pratiprasavaha. What remains? Kaivalyam Swarupa Pratishthava Chiti Shakti Riti. The power of the chit is established. Mm -hmm. It stops there. Whereas Vedanta, I would say, continues. And what is the journey of the soul? How does this soul reach its source? Yoga doesn't concern itself with these questions because it very clearly delineates its framework, which is the mind. Mm -hmm. The clouded mind, the mind that is transparent. Mm -hmm. So I would say that uh, Vedanta could, you could say that uh, in many ways they agree. There are certain areas where naturally there are, as is common with all the darshanas, they refute certain ideas, but eventually going to the same destination. Thank you. Very beautifully put. Uh, if I can add, uh, there is a whole discussion section in the Brahma Sutra itself. Under the Sutra, Etena Yoga Pratyuktaha. Pratyukta. And there Shankara, very Acharya Shankara, very clearly elaborates while our whole, uh, not a conflict, but a whole uh, argument is only between the dualistic and the non-dualistic framework. Yes. But apart from it, when it comes to sadhana, 
we absolutely take what yoga mentions. mentions. It's, it's yes. very clear there. Mm. As you said, it's, it's a part of a continuum and yes. each one has having a very specific pro, yes. uh, focus. Yeah, thank and you. Very yoga much. gives us, you could say in a sense, Vedanta requires a certain maturity spiritually. Whereas Yoga Sutra, especially chapter 2, he's literally taking us by the hand and saying, listen, this is Yama, this is how you should behave. So he's starting there and leading us, True. which is why also the text, in a way, you could say, has a lot of practical relevance. Very true. I mean, this is one of the explanations given generally uh, to uh, describe Raja Yoga. No, Why is it called Raja Yoga? The royal path. For the simple reason that anyone can come in. Exactly. It's, it's a large path where a highway that mm. an advanced practitioner can also come in. A beginner who is learning to drive can also come in. Yes. And each one can practice there and make the progression forward. Yes, yes absolutely. So going to the next question, uh, you were also referring to uh, Pratyahara. So Anil mm. Kumarji asks, how do we know that Pratyahara has been achieved? Like, is there a, is it a, a, a final destination or is it, is it a continuous process where it keeps on happening? I would say Pratyahara is a, definitely a process. It happens when, see, I said withdrawal. See, when you speak of detachment, there's no point in, you know, thinking of a notional detachment. Say, for instance, uh, I don't want to eat sweets or I, I want to give up sweets. So my mind says, okay, don't eat sweet, Pratya, no sugar, no sugar, no sugar. But somewhere inside me, I'm craving. So I wish I could have just one mouth. There's no Pratyahara there. See, Pratyahara is a natural outcome of Pranayama. It will happen naturally. Vairagyam is key. And see, at Vairagyam, there are so many levels. When you look at the Sutra, you have the Aparavairagyam. Then you have Paravairagyam, which is Tatparam Purushakyate Gunavaitrishnam. The Gunas have to be transcended. So that kind of a vairagyam is not easy. Sutra, chapter 3, Sutra 50, he says, Tad vairagya dapi dosha bijakshaye kaivalyam. Where at which level? You know, the highest level of Siddhi. And he says, only vairagyam will remove the dosha, that, that seed for the klesha. Chapter 4, Sutra 25, um, viveka, uh, vivesh, vishesha darshinaha atma bhava bhavana nivrittihi. At the highest level, even that desire for realization, is let gone off. So we are speaking about supreme levels of Vairagya. Mm -hmm. Pratyahara is just a starting point, that's all. Where the senses have withdrawn and the power of the mind starts to assert itself. Thank you very much. So I'll move on to the next question from Radha Raoji, who is also one of our regular participants here. Mm -hmm. She says, uh, so every current movement, because you were referring to the karma, prarabdha karma, agata, nagata in the beginning, she says, so every current movement is an opportunity for free will, despite our prarabdha karma absolutely. or destiny, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Every moment we have a choice. And I can, how I use that choice lies in my mind. In spite or despite my prarabdha. And that brings us back to the theme of the session that is Atha, mm. like here and now, because action is possible only now. Yes. Action cannot take place in the past, neither can take place in the future. future. You might have intentions, aspirations yes. for future, but action has to happen now. And that's where things can be changed. Yes, Thank you. absolutely. So going further, we have a question from Pooja Subramanyaji who says, uh, how should one let go of ego? Because you were referring to it when you were speaking about uh, Ahankara, what and where do we begin with? See, I would say at, the, at a very preliminary level, you know, tapas swadhyaya ishwara pranidhanani kriya yoga. Tapas, some discipline one has to do. We have to learn to work on the kaya, indriya, shuddhi. Swadhyaya, there has to be some point of uh, introspection. Otherwise, where is this question? You have to look at yourself. But most importantly, what my teacher would say is Ishwara Pranidhana. That humility has to be there. Ishwara Pranidhana is the only way to let go of ego because otherwise this ego is a, it will just surge up like that in no time. What will let it down is Ishwara Pranidhana. Just surrender, surrender. To realize that we are only instruments. Something else is operating. We are channels to pass this through. But our job ends there. There is no ownership to being a channel. There's no ownership to what we have, nothing. 
so i would say that that what patanjali gives us as kriya yoga brilliant for the for a practical level see even if it comes to something as simple as cooking to cook tapas you have to source the right food uh, the right products clean them well clean your vegetables now in covid times you clean them three times four times swadhyaya you have to think a little bit about you know what goes with what this is what our mm-hmm. grandmothers had they had the ability to know what combines with what which vegetables go together you could say this is mundane this is silly but yoga has to apply here and now and then what ishwara pranidana you do your best and then it still goes wrong what can you do you accept it this is true of gardening it's true of anything that you do i would say those three pillars of kriya yoga are our starting point very true yeah so effort awareness and surrender yes yeah that's the process to work with anything and uh, as uh, pooja ji had asked even about mm-hmm. letting go of the ego mm mm-hmm. yes so uh there are many many compliments that have poured in from your students from your friends and all the attendees of our session just to read out a couple of them uh we have uh, one which says thanks for the generosity to make such a wonderful session available thank you very much nitya this is from nadeen delpur and thanks nitya ji it was enlightening from prashant dubey ji and one of your students yon maldona i think that's from mexico yeah, yeah. It says congratulations to my dear teacher oh, so the you. list is long i just read out a few of thank them thank you so much and then uh, we have a question from ramkrishnan ji who asks how does one implement these ideas because what you were saying were very practical ideas they were not just to be reflected upon in leisure or some outside the day to day life okay how does one implement these ideas in an educational institution Uh, probably uh, uh, he has also mentioned a specific uh, uh, situation also in a research laboratory in a truly genuine way without becoming some kind of self help motivational session can you offer us some specific suggestions you mean research from a yoga perspective or generally research? no i think the work space i guess so oh, in a work space see again i would say um, you know the simplest way that two things see a i have to make my effort some sadhana has to be there it could be asana practice it could be pranayama practice it could be a committed abhyasa because i need to do something otherwise this is not going to change but also i would say a certain a broadness of vision you know again ishwara pranidana that to accept limitations in self and the other is also a way of looking at ishwara pranidana because what we have is a gift so can i first of all refrain from criticism can i look at everything as valuable no matter how trivial i think someone or some contribution is can i change that samskara because that samskara is coming from the vyuttana samskaras it's coming from my ego it could be fear that someone is better than me it could be fear of not being adequate fear of challenge fear of debate fear of losing my status so many things but can, if i start learning to appreciate beauty to appreciate knowledge to appreciate everything that is good everywhere that itself becomes a starting point for samatva to realize that i am limited everyone else is limited and so which means when you start off from that point of no expectation then everything is considered to be a gift but mm-hmm. to do that you need a sadhana you need a practice it doesn't just happen true so thank you very much and the next question is also little connected to it so Uh, you might be able to add a few more things here this is from geeta ramanna ji who is again a regular participant she says thank you a thought provoking session to watch ourselves every moment but how does one ease the burden of guilt how to handle a toxic environment who bring about worst in us so there are two questions one is about uh, getting uh, free of guilt and the other one is how do you overcome or how do you manage in a toxic environment see guilt is a quite a challenge because guilt again is a product of our mind from our expectations and then what we think others expect of us and then falling short of that again i think the the it will come back to ishwara pranidhana yes there was a mistake made i made a mistake can i apologize and see this is not merely a lip service apology can i truly mean that apology and then learn to let go see that is why when we have so many kshama shlokas in our tradition 
even the first thing you do when you step on the ground you say pada sparsham kshamaswame i am i am transgressing i am entering a space that's not mine i apologize so a little bit i think if we start bringing that mindfulness with regard to intention little by little we can cope it's not easy it's really difficult but little by little we have to learn to let go of things that we do not have control over certain things happened i was at fault now i realize i apologize let it go take the next step again come back to the new atha and which was the second part of the question uh, that was about a toxic environment how do you deal with toxic environment who despite our willingness they try to get the worst out of us see these are the triggers right this is where yoga becomes a shield that we can't change the world outside the only thing i can change is my mind what can i do to change my mind ashtanga system you have the whole system yama niyama in fact uh, my teacher would say patanjali presents yama niyama first krishnamacharya was very emphatic he would say you don't do the yama you are not eligible for uh, practice hmm esikachar in the heart of yoga also he says he says some of us don't know we are so confused about what yama is we don't know what ahimsa is we don't know what satya is we don't know what the niyamas are we don't have the ability for discipline so he says start somewhere start at your body level start with asana hmm. something will change because of the panchamaya being interconnected start physically start with the breath when you do this other things will start changing and then you realize that something has happened i had a student uh, she was a student of chanting um and primarily chanting and um, she observed after about um, about a year of classes she told me i realized that something that has changed in me i used to be very irritable when people flouted the rules especially you know when in a traffic signal you have someone coming in the way or you have people not behaving in an appropriate manner and i used to be furious and she said i realize now that it still bothers me but i'm not expressing it as rage i am able to be a upeksha a witness you be an observer don't let that influence you because that is what patanjali says maitri karuna mudita upeksha bhavanatah chitta prasadanam for me to have a prasada chitta upeksha becomes essential especially in a toxic environment that sure. i don't let that filter how do i do it i shield myself with asana with pranayama with mantra with meditation what thank you so much i mean i'm just reminded of two things one as you were saying about uh, the uh, upeksha it also links back to our initial discussion of the vrittis the klishta vritti and aklishta vritti the yes. trigger would be same but yes. how am i interpreting it what yes. is where is it leading it to be is it leading me towards a klesha yes. again the whole pattern or am i able to come out of it the aklishta vritti mm-hmm. and also about uh, the guilt aspect i think you mentioned it very beautifully and like this is one of the things i also share with my students and all that in the scheme of yoga there is no scope for guilt there is this scope for error in yes. fact in the indian tradition errors yes. are admitted and prayashchitta is very valuable, valuable but there is nothing like a sin or a, uh, a i mean a guilt which follows a sin i think this is something that we really need to uh, realize the importance of this thought where no guilt is allowed exactly i saw is... this if i may interrupt um one of my teachers i think uh, shridharan ji uh, who's a senior mentor he was teaching us once about punya and papa and you know this always punya is associated punya papa is associated with guilt see the word punya comes from punati it purifies anything that purifies that refreshes your mind okay we agree papa we can interpret as pa apa pa is protection what is protecting me my mind is protecting me my mind because of its strength because of its clarity is protecting me when that protection is removed apa then what happens that becomes papa so i have done something my thoughts have led me in a direction that has caused that protection to go away what should i do change the thought mm-hmm. so it will come back to that what should i do in the next moment so that i can convert that so this is where the guilt regarding papa you have to let go yes it happened next step what do i do again that comes back to what you were mentioning as ishwara pranidhana yes ishwara pranidhana yeah. so thank you very much uh, there are 
couple of questions and inquiries because you presented yoga sutra in such a beautiful manner like we have this expression in sanskrit no karatala amalakam so you have a, an amalaka in your hand and you have the 360 degree view so that's the way you presented it and so what book would you recommend for a beginner to get an insight or an understanding of yoga sutra if you asked me i would say heart of yoga it's a timeless work by deskachar i think it always holds appeal for anyone in any tradition you don't you can be from any tradition mm -hmm. because um, for me personally i would say that sir had a way of of bringing these very very lofty teachings to our level and in the heart of yoga it's literally the essence of the yoga sutra hmm. thank you very much and again as we are even discussing and uh, looking into the questions we have many many compliments that have come in for the generosity with which you have shared so everyone is expressing his or her gratitude for what they have received this evening thank you very much nritya ji and if there are any unanswered questions if someone wants you could email them to me and sure. i'm happy to so that is the our next question how can people reach out to you uh, you can reach out to me um through my email id which i think dr banavati has nritya jagannathan at kym.org our work all that we do at the krishnamacharya yoga mandiram is accessible on our website kym.org and we frequently we have a number of programs coming up online courses uh, sutra studies philosophy a lot of things are coming up we run teacher trainings so you're welcome to reach out to me at any point of time and um, i'm i'm happy if you share my um uh, if someone needs my number to reach me that's also fine uh, dr i have just shared your email id and if there's any request i can share and uh, so you can find a lot of talks of nritya ji online and there are many many courses that are being offered by kym online and there is also this uh, journal darshanam of which darshanam. she is the editor so you can follow her work and all her writings there as well darshanam is a free offering from the kym and uh, uh, i shouldn't say it myself but some grace has made it move and so far we've been very lucky to have some really really insightful pieces coming together in the darshanam so it's something that i would uh, recommend i would uh, strongly suggest because it's a free offering you're welcome to download and it will give you a feel for the tradition and what we do so thank you very much uh, once again nritya ji i'll come back to you for your message what is a message that you would like to share with our, all our participants this evening or this morning because we have friends across the globe who have joined us but before that i would like to make the announcements for tomorrow so tomorrow morning we have a session by vijay dhruve ji who is a yoga teacher and a therapist who will be leading a session a practical session on mindfulness using the principle of reciprocal inhibition during asana practice reciprocal inhibition is a very technical understanding of how the muscle movement happens within the body and he will be looking into the asana practice keeping this aspect in mind using the principle of reciprocal inhibition during asana practice and in the noon session we have it on nada yoga and sound well being by orelio and team he is the director of swaram Uh, which is there in Oroville. Many of you might know about Oroville, an uh, experimental township that has come outside Pondicherry. And Aurelio leads a center called so, uh, uh, Swaram, and he will be presenting in along with his team on a, a session on Nada Yoga and sound well-being. And in the evening, we have a wonderful session by Krishna Das, who is a very well-known personality in the field of music, in the field of bhajans. in the field of kirtans uh, he is the founder of karuna records and is also the international kirtan wala that's how people call him and he will be presenting a live session of an immersion into bhakti which is called as deepening the yoga of devotion through kirtan so please join us for all these sessions we look forward to uh, have you with us up to 20th and as i said earlier there is also a possibility that we might extend the whole festival for few more days and for that we need your support uh, so if you can kindly drop us a mail if you would be interested in the extension of it i have given the email id of uh, indika yoga namaste at indikayoga.com so you can all leave us a message there 
and that will help us to make a decision whether we can extend the festival or not and also i'd like to add for the benefit of our participants who might have joined today all these sessions are being recorded and they are made available on indica yoga youtube channel so we so far had about nearly 60 sessions uh, in this festival each of the session is available there there are some sessions you would want to go back again and again like the session that we had today like what nritya ji offered was a capsule so there was so much we might want to revisit and try to understand it uh, in a deeper way so that will always be helpful so make use of the resources available make use of the generosity which the the the, the teachers have showered upon us so i kindly request you to watch the videos there and also subscribe to the channel and on indica yoga website indicayoga.com you can get to know about the events that will follow for the next week so we have announced the programs for half the week next week and then few more events will also be added soon so you can mark your calendars and join us accordingly so with this request i now come back to nritya ji for a message before we conclude the session i think this is the hardest part <laughs> well um two things one i would say shraddha increasingly we live in a time when all that is indian indian knowledge systems are being questioned and unfortunately many in my generation as well we've moved very far away there's so much gap between the the masters who gave us these teachings what wealth of wisdom they had and where we are so much gap and unfortunately for us our education has not helped us to bridge that gap it's only divided us further mm -hmm. and so in these times when uh, the, the uh, uh, see sanadana dharma is something that very word indicates it will stay forever and this is not as narrow as being merely a religion it's much larger than that it's a way of life and it has to be it's a sanadana dharma but we need to uphold it there has to be some reverence for the tradition and it's so easy to dismiss so many symbols you just dismiss it as oh this is superstitious this is silly this is old wives tales this has no basis mm -hmm. why are we dismissing that not everything needs proof and there's something that's beyond all that is provable all that is rational all that is quantifiable there exists a world of abundance and a world of ishvara that we are incapable of comprehending and so what can i do i can have shraddha just believe in it because mm -hmm. i don't yet experience i don't know but until that becomes my knowledge can i hold on with patience so i would say shraddha and along with that vismaya this idea of um of wonder mm -hmm. of uh, just seeing everything around us with wonder taking the time to look again because that's also yoga that freshness of perspective because we become so very mechanical and then you know as children we have that sense of wonder the same thing again and again i see it in my 9 year old daughter mm -hmm. the kind of delight she takes in what i would say oh this is just an ordinary experience can i revisit that because somewhere along the line we become so jaded we've lost that but if we can recreate that sense of wonder in everything then that itself is such a big uh, that is a gift in our lives because that will completely change our perspective of the world and of people around us so i could i these are the two things that immediately come to mind thank you very much nitya ji uh, if i just uh, can add uh, this has been one of the recurring themes that has come again and again which many teachers have brought in when especially during the message time or during their talk that to explore and rediscover that rasa and that will even give us shraddha that will give us the required courage and yes yes i'm sorry i was lost in between i think i had lost the connection uh, so this is a recurrent theme and thank you very much for connecting connecting intuitively to that theme and allowing that thought to flow that is that is ishara pranidana that's not me that is how the universe flows so i think we have to just be grateful for that grace so thank you very much
Thank uh, you. With the clarity of thought that you presented Yoga Sutra, I think this will stay with us for long. Thank you very much. It's all credit to my teacher. Uh, everything is Gurum Prakashaya Dhiman. It's the smallest contribution we can make is to his memory. Thank you. So, pranams to the Parama Guru and the Guru. And really, today it has been a day for paying tributes to Krishna Macharya Ji, Deshika Acharji. Morning, we had a session with Jai Ramanji. So, that we started with that thought, and we are also continuing with the same thought throughout the day. Thank you very much for this. I also would like to thank all our participants who have joined from different places. Those the session has got extended more than 40 minutes. They are all happily enjoying this delight, partaking in this delight in with what you have offered us today. So I thank all of them. And I also would like to thank our technical team who have been uh, making this possible. So thank you very much, everyone. Namaste. Dhanyavadaha. Shubhadinam. Shubharatri. As it may be in your own places. Shubhadinam.